Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, our region's longest running public affairs program. Lawmakers from Northeastern Minnesota are joining us today for a recap of the week's activities at the state capitol. This is your opportunity to call or email your legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, Tony Sertich. With just one week left in the legislative session, lawmakers are getting a breather this weekend for Mother's Day, but they will hit the ground running on Monday for a final sprint to the constitutionally mandated end to the legislative session on May 17th. Today's show is a great opportunity for our viewers to ask questions to the legislators who represent you. Please feel free to call the number at the bottom of the screen or email questions to ask at wdse.org. And we have great guests to answer those questions this evening. First up, we have Representative Julie Sandsted. She's a DFLer from Hibbing, representing House District 6A. Welcome, Representative Sandsted. Thank you. And also here again for a second time is Representative Spencer Igo, a Republican from Grand Rapids, representing House District 5B. Welcome, Representative Igo. Thank you. Great to have you both here. So now we have seven days left of the legislative session. Um, we get a question every week about the PPP program and the unemployment insurance tax in the tax bill, but a bigger, broader question. The legislative leader said they were hoping to get the targets for the state budget done by Friday. It's Sunday, there's still no targets. What's the likelihood that you all are gonna get done with your session in one week? We'll start with you, Representative Igo. Yeah, so you know, being a first-term member, um, I'm looking to those with more seniority to kind of learn where we're gonna be. Um, and it's a mixed bag. I mean, I have senior leaders that are saying, you know what, I think we're really gonna come down in this last week, um, knuckle down and, and get the work done. But then there's some that are um, worried that we might have to go a few extra days to get things done. Um, me personally, I like to be half full rather than half empty. So I'm hoping, especially after this little break we had for Mother's Day, that we're gonna get back Monday um, and, and get our work done on time. That's what I think Minnesotans want and what they deserve. Representative right, so Sandstead, you've been around for a few of these sessions. Uh, your deadline is May 17th. The budget has to be passed though by June 30th. And so what's the likelihood of getting done on time this year? We're headed to a special session okay. without a doubt in my mind right now uh, with one week remaining, 13 omnibus bills sitting in committee right now, not having those reports come out of conference committee, not on the floor, no targets yet. Um, really some of the committee stalled. I think it's highly unlikely, as unfortunate as that is, I think it's highly unlikely we'll finish by the 17th and we're gonna have to get to a special session. Great, well, uh, both of you serve on certain committees and I wanna do a little bit of a deep dive. This year, we haven't had a lot of folks that serve on the education committees yet. Mm -hmm. Representative Sandstead, school teacher as well, yes. vice chair of the education finance committee. Uh, we're looking at two bills really that are looking for compromise and the major tenants of those bills I'd love for you to get in, involved in. Uh, on the House side, a 2% increase in funding for our public schools. And on the Senate uh, Republican majority side, education saving accounts. Where do you see that bill sitting right now and how are we gonna get that over the finish line? That's a great question. Um, they're, they're really big priorities for both uh, of the bodies and there has to be some kind of compromise. Uh, two and two on the formula is, is minimally what school districts need. In the House, we had even tied it to inflation and working towards that, which I don't think is gonna pass this year. It would be great if it did because I know that's what school districts need. On the Senate side, you know, they're looking at a form of vouchers basically, and that's a priority because they, as they see it, not every child needs to be in a public school. It's not the best fit for them. And yet, you know, those students deserve a quality education as well. So there's, there's some wrestling that needs to be done and, and there's a lot in the bill that can be bargained for. So I hope they can work it out. Great. Representative Igo, you sit on the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, and there are some loggerheads there as well. And we're reading in the paper and watching uh, really uh, some lines being drawn around clean car admission and then in the Senate saying if that's in the bill that they're not going to pass the budgets for the DNR and others and that could impact campsites, state parks and the like. And so what do you see as a way to get there to be compromise uh, for that issue as well? Right. So, you know, um, being on that committee this year, you know, I've learned a lot about where Minnesota's headed and how we're a leader already when it comes to, you know, how we approach energy and, and our climate um, and our policy around that. You know, the, the California cars mandate uh, where everything's kind of gummed up right now is, um, it's a sticking point because it's, it's, a, it's being a mandate that's being moved by our governor, right? It's being moved by a state agency. It's being moved by the courts. Um, the people I'm hearing from in my district and other constituents from around the state, 
they want that process to move to the legislature, right? And to have an, an honest debate about where we're gonna accept our mandates from. Um, so this, this is a point where I'm hoping we can have compromise and say, you know what, we're coming through COVID right now, let's get Minnesota back on track, let's have a balanced budget, let's have an honest conversation about our, our policy moving forward for uh, electric vehicles and cleaner vehicles in the future. Let's have that next session when we're gonna go dive deeper into policy, let's get the budget done right now. So I'm hoping maybe that we could take a pause on that and move on to it next year and have honest debate about the issue rather than trying to jam it through right now when Minnesotans need a lot more. Great. So uh, we're speaking of the budget here, uh, looking at roughly 50 to $52 billion for two year budget. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some spending initiatives, uh, but the tax bill is always uh, the big bill at the end, how you pay for things uh, as well. There are certain differences there. Can you talk about the, the house proposal a bit and uh, what, what you like about it, some concerns you might have, or, or where do you see the tax bill shaking? Up? You know, it's been a very interesting year because when we started this legislative session, we went in anticipating a $4.1 billion deficit. Um, and that was March of 2020 that we had that estimate. Now in March of 2021, we are at a $1.6 billion surplus. So I don't think it's really time to raise taxes um, with, with the surplus. With that being said, I can say that I did like some portions of the House proposal um, because as they as they did raise taxes, that money was going to be used to really help some wonderful programs. Um, some of the differences that we had in the two bills really around unemployment and the PPP, uh, the Senate had some proposals, but the House went even further and covered it to a much greater extent. I think the Senate had 18% covered, the House was going all the way at 94%, which would have, you know, which we would have been able to do with the House bill. Now we're kind of on pause with that. We'll see where it goes. Um, but I'm, I'm glad there's an appetite in both bodies to get something done around those two issues. Great. Uh, Russ and Vigo, we talked a bit about the tax bill uh, when you were here about a month or so ago. Uh, now that you've been around another full month in the legislature, further thoughts on, on the state of the tax bill and the compromise needed to get done there? Right, you know, kind of like I said last time, now that we have these numbers, you know, um, we have a surplus there's no reason right now to be raising taxes and fees on Minnesotans. I think that's really, really important that this tax bill comes out without those added fees and increases. We need to be giving the tools needed to Minnesotans to, to get back up, have a summer, and get their businesses going, get their family lives started again. And that's not slapping more taxes and fees and growing government, really. It's, you know, tighten the belt a little bit, and let's get through this thing. We're very thankful that we have a surplus. And with these federal dollars coming in, let's fund the programs needed to get Minnesotans back on track. I think too on, on that topic, um, there's so much uncertainty around exactly how the federal dollars can be used and how much is coming in. We know it's gonna be quite a bit. So I think it's really important to prioritize, understand those dollars, prioritize um, how we're going to use them before we do raise taxes. And especially with those federal <coughs> dollars too, it's very important that the legislature be involved with how that money's appropriated, right? I mean, if it's gonna be almost $2.4 billion, that kind of money really needs to go through the legislative process so that all branches of government are involved and it's handled properly for all the citizens of Minnesota. Great. Uh, this is just a reminder, if you have a question for our legislators, please email uh, us or uh, call the phone number at the bottom of your screen. And we do have a call. Uh, Diane from Chisholm is a nurse. Uh, she wants to know, what are the legislators going to do about the Essential Workers Emergency Leave Act? Is that a piece of legislation that either of you are familiar with? The Essential Workers Emergency Leave Act. I don't know exactly what's gonna happen on that one. As I understand it, that's part of all of the final negotiations that are right now kind of gummed up and on hold. So all I can say is probably to be continued. I know that it's a priority in the House. Um, I don't know that we have the same uh, reception on the other side, but these are the pieces that are being ironed out. Great. Anything to add? Yeah, you know, with my committees, I, I'm not very familiar with the bill, but with without even conference committee reports out, I'm not really sure where it's going. So I'll kind of second what, what Julie said there. Great. Well, let's take people kind of behind the scenes. That's the last week of session. Uh, your first term, uh, Representative Sandstead, you've been around the block a bit. When we're talking about budget targets and compromise and these conference committees, uh, it's really a lot of hurry up and wait from what I recall. And so as legislators sitting there, you know, the leaders meet with the governor to try to hammer out the big picture details, and then folks get to work uh, finding the smaller compromises. Uh, from where you're sitting right now, kind of what's your job and role in this last week as the leaders are, are, are compromising and negotiating on the big picture? What, what are you guys up to while they're doing that? 
Well, I'll start. Um, so for me right now, I'm watching a lot of the, the policy that's going to affect northeastern Minnesota, right? You know, so it's mo making sure that the bills that I've been working on, working with other colleagues, are are getting the right voice in conference committee, right? So, you know, one of the bills um, that I'm really happy that I'm moving on is actually in the public safety bill, um, and it's it's a 911 dispatchers working group. So it's going to be to get all of our dispatchers around the state. Um, standardized um, workloads, standardized um, training, so that everyone's on the same page to keep Minnesotans safe. So something I'm doing on that, luckily it's in both omnibus bills in the House and the Senate, but it's having the conversations with those on the conference committee so they know the importance of that bill, so it doesn't get lost and forgotten in this, in this uh, conference committee process. So that's a lot of the work right now with me not being on a conference committee, is just making sure that those policies that maybe are smaller but have a huge impact up here are remembered. So lots of phone calls. <laughs> Great. Um, Pretty much the same thing, really watching some of the legislation that I have going in different omnibus bills, um, working with the chairs on both sides to say why this is important, to keep it alive and relevant, um, and then really becoming uh, a lot more informed on the other omnibus bills that I'm not a, you know, a committee member of, and trying to really dig in and find the nuances of what's involved in there and trying to, to figure out if this is something at the end that I can support, if there's pieces within a, a bill that I just could not support and, and become familiar with that. Great. Well, one big topic um, that uh, could take some time in the House uh, while you all are waiting for the compromise to get done is uh, the cannabis or marijuana legislation to legalize uh, cannabis in the state of Minnesota. It's gone through a long committee process in the House, not moving in the Senate, but it looks like you all uh, may be uh, uh, debating it and voting on it uh, this week. So uh, your thoughts about that bill? Representative Stancy, we'll start with you. I'm always amazed at this bill that it's such a priority for so many Minnesotans when there's so many other issues that we're looking at. Um, personally, I, I really am not fully supportive of this yet. Um, I, I can see both sides of it. I'm fully in support of an expansion of medical marijuana, but to legalize full recreational marijuana um, I think we have uh, other priorities to be looking at. We still run into federal conformity issues. Um, I think there's more work to do, um, uh, but I do understand the side, like people are using right now, that is happening, and it would be better for us uh, if we could do it in a controlled manner, safer, knowing what's going into it, um, regulating the industry and not just having, we see a lot of issues you know, on the range and other places with drugs and, and it can be a gateway drug and, and there's always lacing. So I would, I understand the importance of uh, regulating, but I think we have other priorities right now to focus on. Yeah, you know, kind of along that lines, you know, the conversation for marijuana is here, right? We're seeing it around the country. We're seeing it to states that we border, right? But this is not the time. It's not moving at all in the Senate. So we're going to have this bill on the House floor. There's going to be a huge conversation that's going to eat up a ton of time, time that I think we both agree on should be used to fix these conference committees and, and get some bills done and give Minnesotans a balanced budget. So in this bill, even it, it's moved through some of my committees. It's very, it feels rushed, I'll be very honest. I mean, it was thrown together, and I think we need to have honest conversations about how do we regulate and get opinions from Minnesotans. You know, when the, when the Capitol has fences around it and people can't come to the people's house and have conversations, how can we really hear what Minnesotans want if they actually want you know, legalization and what do they want their regulations to look like if we do move down that line? So you know, moving there, I think this, this is just the wrong time to be having this conversation. Um, again, should we, we should push this out and have a conversation when everyone can be in person again, where we can really talk about where have the shortfalls been in other states? Has it been a good thing? What are the side effects? They're not happening right now, so you know, I'm a little disappointed that we're trying to move this through right now. I would say on this issue, um, I don't think it's an issue that's been rushed. I think that this is an issue that Minnesota has been facing for many years. This train has left the station a while ago. Um, it is an evolving conversation, and I think that there's still more to learn about it. But emerging from a pandemic and the work that we need to do, I would agree that I don't, I don't think this is our priority right now. Great, and we'd like to welcome you all into the conversation. So as a reminder, please call or email if you have questions that you'd like to ask our legislators. Uh, speaking about the pandemic, uh, Governor Walls this week announced a turn of the dial uh, that happened on Friday in some instances, and then a lot of the really the restrictions and regulations ending by the end of this month before Memorial Day weekend, uh, with ultimately um, July 1st being the end of the mass mandate and maybe sooner if we hit 70% of vaccinated Minnesotans. 
Uh, along with that, there was, was about two dozen executive orders and emergency powers that the governor has, and he reduced that in half, or is proposing to reduce that in half. I know that this issue around emergency powers and what's open and not, and what power the governor has versus the legislative has been a big contentious issue this legislative session. Uh, now that we're on this path, and it looks like we're towards the end of uh, these regulations and emergency powers, uh, what more, if anything, needs to be done uh, that you see the legislature doing around COVID, emergency powers, and executive orders. Representative Igo, why don't you go first? Yeah, so you know, I think um, the governor's uh, statement, you know, turning the dials back is the statement that, you know, we're in remission of this pandemic. We have beaten it as a state. You know, we've really come together um, from our families to our businesses. Um, we've overcame this. And I think the, the phrase I've been using with, to the high school students I talk to is, you know, this, this instance we went through, they looked in the face of adversity and Minnesotans have smiled and we've beaten this thing and we're moving forward. And I think the best thing that the governor could do now is, you know, as we approach these, these steps that he's put forward is relinquish his emergency powers on his own, right? So that means not calling us back in June to extend them and realizing that, okay, if we're gonna be to the point where we're not gonna have masks, you know, if you do the math at current vaccination rates, the masks could be gone as soon as May 31st. So if that's the case, we're not wearing masks anymore and businesses are completely open, I don't really see a need for emergency powers and I don't think a lot of other Minnesotans do. So, I mean, my ask right now, being here with all of you, is and if the governor sees something like this, is relinquish, relinquish these powers on your own. Give Minnesotans hope in government that we have co-equal branches, that we're all working together and we're doing what's best for all Minnesotans. So I guess that's kind of my last pitch, is that in these conference committees, we're trying to get bills that are going to lift Minnesotans up. That's what they deserve. Give people hope again and, you know, like I say, bring our best days to reality. Representative Sand said you've authored some legislation on emergency powers, not just for today, but moving forward. So uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, actually, I think there's a whole lot of education that needs to be done around the, the emergency powers. Um, there are some real benefits for our state having emergency powers. Um, for instance, right now under, under the governor's emergency powers, there's $30 million a, a month coming in for uh, food supplement in our state. Um, we had uh, telehealth provisions um, as a result of the emergency powers, which we wouldn't have been able to access before. Mental health services, uh, all of those are very, very significant. The, the mass vaccination clinics and opportunities there are a result of the emergency powers. So I don't think that we're beyond this pandemic completely. Um, we certainly are not what I would call in an emergency phase, but what our, what our laws don't have right now is a management phase. And I think um, that's something that we need to look at. I have a bill right now in play that is looking at chapter 12, which governs uh, the emergency powers, where you're outside of the emergency proper, but more into a managerial phase. And I think that that's what we need to do moving forward. Um, I don't think this is gonna be the last pandemic that we will see, hopefully in our lifetime, yes, but um, it's not gonna be the last event like this. And we do need to have an off-ramp or a way of, of handling this. We saw that through this experience, we really weren't prepared. It isn't anybody's fault. It's just the laws that we operated under, the laws that are on the book, and they're insufficient. They, they, we've learned from this, so we need to build it out a little bit. You know, and just kind of adding on that, I think, you know, as we approach that, that off-ramp, Minnesotans are desiring transparency right now. You know, in this modern world, um, you can go on the internet and see and hear just about anything. And the thing that I'm hearing from my constituents is they want to know, how is this being handled? Where is the governor's decision making being? And I think as we approach the summer and everything starts to lift, you know, we as a legislature and the governor should have open conversations. Talk about why these, these emergency orders were declared, why these declarations happened. This is what we did wrong. This is what we did right. And Minnesotans deserve that because I think that's the next step in reinstating that faith in government. Because people are really worried, you know, when you hear emergency powers and you hear, you know, control over everything, that's not what Minnesota stands for. That's not what the United States of America stand for. And it's really easy to get lost in confusion. So I think it's our job as members of the legislature to really inform the citizens of the state. Let them know this is, yes, we failed here. This is where the governor did well. This is where we didn't do so well. Have that conversation. And on that, I would also say that's part of the language that I've included in House File 1515. Um, and not just transparency for the public, which I think is very critical, but an understanding for the legislature um, and the legislators who have to make decisions. You know, one of the problems or one of the things I think I felt frustrated about is during the seven special sessions, we really didn't have an opportunity for committee hearings or dialogue. Um, now that we're in session, we've been able to do some of that, but 
we're really behind. Coming in, you know, seven sessions later put us in a bad place. So I think just to have that constant information available to us, and I do believe in co-equal branches of government, I think that puts us on a more level footing. So again, there's work to be done in Chapter 12. Great. Uh, we have another question from a viewer, Yvonne in Hibbing. Uh, is the legislature working to get federal funding to help pay for the high utility bills caused by the polar vortex that impacted the energy industry in Texas? She says, Hibbing, I'm sure Epson Stan said, you know this, uh, utility rates went up following the bad weather and she had seen other states reach out for federal funding. Anything in the works on that that you know about? Absolutely, we're working um, both at the state level and the federal level too to get some kind of support because we were just pummeled in, in Hibbing, to be frank. Um, our utility is a municipal utility, so the, the state PUC doesn't really have oversight. Um, it's, it's really a shame. It's price gouging what happened. Um, unfortunately, the state of Minnesota doesn't have laws on the book to have prevented what happened, and this didn't happen, and I need to make it very, very clear, this didn't happen just in Hibbing. It wasn't just Hibbing or Minnesota that was impacted. This happened nationwide, and really this has to probably get kicked up to the federal level, um, and there should be an investigation, and there should be, I'm, I'm hoping, some support there financially, and hopefully the state is able to do something too with those federal dollars coming in. Great. Uh, so when I talk to folks on the street, uh, they, they watch the legislature and they say, you guys go down there, you, you fight it out, and then everything happens at the last minute, and why don't you do your work sooner? The other thing I hear about is compromise versus strongly held positions. And so really one of my last main questions to you all is, uh, and I'll start with you, Representative Vigo, um, where do you see the need for your party to compromise maybe a key position to get to a solution to this budget stalemate. It, so, you know, so often we, we can beat each other up on the opposite sides and say, here's what you should do. More introspectively, where do you see your side of the aisle needing to compromise to get to a budget solution? That really is a tough question of the night, isn't it? Um, you know, I think compromise is a really important thing. Um, and I think we're in a time right now where people think compromise is a weak word, right? But I mean, to those listening to the conversation here, I want to say how important compromise really is. You know, we as a civilization, as Minnesotans, wouldn't be here today without the ability to sit down like we are right now, talk about our differences, and come together on issues, right? Um, I, I think there's going to be compromise to be had. I, I'm hoping that, you know, when we look at the, the environment bill um, and, the, and the climate and energy bill, we can find some things in there. Okay, we agree. We need to move forward uh, as being, you know, a responsible producer of energy. I think we could find a solution there. Um, one of the solutions is, is, is what I've been working on a lot. And, you know, we, talk, we were just talking about the utility problem there. I just want to jump in and add on that quick and just say that really have showed the, the reason to have an, uh, an all-of-the-above energy approach, right? So the current bill moving through the House will eliminate, you know, Boswell Energy Center, which is in my backyard there in Grand Rapids and Cohasset, right? So when we're talking about that bill and I'm talking about the compromise, coming back to the question you asked, the policy there is really extreme. Mandates that are going to totally strip you know, natural gas and, and coal from being the backbone of our energy grid, even though the clean energy for them is here. So I'm thinking the compromise there is, okay, let's lead forward and, and start moving towards clean energy, but then let's build it and construct it here. Copper and nickel is right here in northeastern Minnesota. I'm sure it's been talked about on this show before. Julie and I are very familiar with it. Part of the things that I've been trying to add to that bill is let's compromise and say, okay, well, let's start moving that direction let's mine and produce the materials needed here. And I think that's one way for us to come together on the issue. You know, Republicans don't want to necessarily live off coal and natural gas forever. We just want to move towards clean alternatives that are sourced responsibly here in Minnesota. So I think there's a compromise right there to be had, and, I'm, and I've been trying to have that conversation with members of the Energy Committee and, and, and members of the Senate so we can come together on that solution and realize that, you know, America's future and the world's future starts in northeastern Minnesota. Representative Stan said, where do DFLers need to uh, show compromise to get to a solution to this budget stalemate that's rapidly approaching? I think the problem goes back even further than one party or the other. And I think really in a nutshell, the biggest problem that we're facing that always leaves us kind of gummed up at the end is that we have a $52 billion budget to settle, 80 days this session, 40 days uh, next biennium, um, 20, over 2,600 bills already introduced. And so we're moving too fast in too many directions. Um, 
and our omnibus, omnibus bills are just packed full of things. So when it comes to compromise, it, it's almost impossible to start. There's so much to work through. I think we really need to be narrowing our focus, doing less, doing less well, and um, going from there. And I think that we have a lot to learn from each other on each side. And I think if it were a little more focused, um, we could get to that compromise a whole lot faster. Great. Well, uh, 30 seconds each. I want to uh, hear from you uh, real quickly about something you think that's going to get done this year below the radar that nobody's been talking about that's going to be good for folks in northeastern Minnesota. About 30 seconds apiece. Whoever wants to go first. You can go first if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> um, for northeast, well, I'm hoping that uh, it's still a hope of mine that with the SR Steel situation going on, I have a piece of legislation introduced that will protect the permits if the leases are indeed pulled and something goes very haywire. Um, I think the most important thing is protecting those leases, or not the leases, excuse me, the permits, um, so we don't have to start over from ground zero. And I'm still hopeful that that might happen. Okay, 20 seconds. All right, um, for me, I mentioned it earlier, my 911 dispatchers bill. Being included in both the Senate and the House, if, when that passes, hopefully, that's gonna mean that our dispatchers across the state, especially on the range in our Northland, are gonna be able to keep us all safe. And final note, I just wanna wish my mom a happy Mother's Day. You're having this opportunity. Happy Mother's Day to you, you, Julie, and to all Thank mothers you. out there. You're all wonderful. Great. Well, you stole my thunder at the end here, Representative Vigo, and that's quite all right because we're out of time. And I'd like to thank you, Representative Vigo and Representative Sandstead. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. And a new grandmother we just found yes. out as well. <laughs> and I'd like to wish all our viewers at home uh, who are moms a happy Mother's Day, especially to my wife, Tally, and my mom who's watching right now. I love you. And uh, we'll tune in again next Sunday, May 16th, for this season's final edition of Minnesota Legislative Report, when we will welcome more lockmakers from northern Minnesota to our show. For the team at WDSC, I'm Tony Sertich. Have a great evening.